Good morning. morning. So this morning we're going to do something a little bit different, which was planned, by the way, except I'm going to do it more different than a different plan. (laughs) And so it should be just fine. Um, So first I want to touch upon a couple things. First, um, do not fail to get... uh, that bulletin, how many of you have, bo- okay, I mean, ain't got a bulletin, okay, all right, Is that, no, you, you got one, not you ain't, okay, but be sure you keep an eye on this, put this on the fridge, put it on your dashboard, put it wherever you can, remember these dates, because it's, this is the busy season here at our church, more than any other, I mean, we have busy times, but this is a busy time here coming up, so we have gingerbread baking, can't have a making without a baking, yeah, and then we're going to go out there and get the Christmas trees lit, but also um, this is going to be a big seller, so grab some of these. We have more of these than we know what to do with, so you have to give them out, and they're no good after next week, so <laughs> you really got to hand these out. Just take some with you in your wallet, purse, pocket, or wherever, and take them out and share them with anyone you know, everybody you know. Say, hey, come. It's going to be fun. It's free. It's a lot of fun. This is a tradition our church does for this community, and it's a big deal. And also, if you have a little time to help with baking, check in with the baker uh, leaders. Who are the lead bakers, people? Uh, Who's helping? Who's directing us? Dave. Dave? Dave? All right. So his help me is going to be right here. So check in with Angie and tell her, I want to do this. i got to help. The Spirit touched me, and if I don't do it, I know I'll feel terrible. <laughs> All right. And then this is where I'm going to focus in on. So if you want something right in front of you, this is what I'm going to be talking about. Because today, we're going to talk about life in our church. You know, <clears throat> corporations have mission statements. Are you the I beg your pardon? Oh, yeah, yeah, get out of here. (laughs) Send the children to Children's Church. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. I don't remember all the things. I'm usually sitting where you are, you know? Actually, I'm sitting where you are sometimes. Oh, all right. Well, we can do that. I'm not going to be preaching directly from the gospel. We can do our, our scripture thing if you want. All right, let's do this. We're going to do this. All right. Thanks for the reminder. Let's go together. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. All right. Is there anything else I forgot, just in case? All right. Go ahead and go full screen. Let's just let's not waste anything at all. Oh. Yellow on the bottom, right window. You can hear me okay though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. That's the start. So um, when we, um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple things. Number one, how did it go with the Thanksgiving dinner last Sunday? How many of you attended? Okay, great. Almost, a lot of people came, a lot of people I didn't expect to see came. It was a lot of fun. Um, and there was some people who gave thanks, and there was a lot of talk, and I just thought it was a wonderful get-together, and I'm still thankful for that get-together. <coughs> Meant a lot to me, too. And um, that's part of our communityness. That's one of those special meetings we have throughout the year, isn't it, where we talk about how God has impacted our lives and what God means to us. If God is everything he says he is, then it should matter when we spend time with him and when we don't. How many of you have spent time with God this last week? Good. That's a good sign. (laughs) Sometimes we become neglectful, though. I must confess to you that I've just become neglectful over the last month or so been neglectful of reading my scripture, neglectful of spending meaningful prayer time with God. And when I do, 
It affects me. It affects me. And so that's why I think it's important that we encourage one another, and that's part of what's in this. Every corporation has a mission statement. Corporate values is a big deal today. Some of you know this. If you're in corporate America, you work at a mom and pop donut shop, you don't get a mission statement. The mission is donuts are tasty. That's the mission. Provide donuts. Make them sure they're fresh. So there's not a big, but you get the bigger the corporation, the more things you do. Because a church body does many things, we need mission statements. So we're going to do this. It's going to be a little interrogatory. That's a college word. It means that we're going to talk a little bit back and forth like we already have. Thank you. Some of you already talked to me. But that's fine. So next slide. We value the Bible. We want the precepts and principles contained in the Bible to be the final authority for everything we do in life, both personal and church life. We wrote this uh, some time ago. This is just a review, uh, and also because there's new people coming, and we should go over this from time to time. At my job, the corporate values are there, and they remind us from time to time because they know you sometimes forget. You need to refocus, just like if you haven't been spending time in the Word or praying with God. We value the Bible. I'm a biblical fundamentalist. Thank you. What does it mean? It means that I believe that there's no truer way to find God than through the Bible, the scriptures. Because men get it wrong. Men corrupt things in our hearts and we need to get it wrong. So the teaching of men alone is not a good route to go. And churches and denominations can sometimes get things and go off track. That happens too, doesn't it? And so I decided that I would commit myself to the Bible and trust it. And I took a chance. I took a chance. I took a chance. I said, I'm going to read this like it's a message God wants me to know today. I'm going to assume God wants me to know what this, know something. And I, a, a deliberate search. Sometimes you can just turn to a random page and do that. That's not bad. But I think God wants us to be more intelligent, too, about it. Doesn't he? <laughs> he, expect, he gave us a mind. He gave you intelligence. He expects you to use it. That makes sense, doesn't it? I think it was Galileo who said, correct me if I'm wrong, Rich. It was Galileo who said, I, do, I find it hard to believe, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I find it hard to believe that God would give us an intelligence and then tell us not to use it. He gave us critical minds that can discern the truth. He expects us to use that skill. It's a talent, but it's a skill too. And we can develop it. So God wants us to understand our universe. And I can trust the Bible. And I've been, I've been following God by trusting in the words of the Bible and what he has to say for a while now, just a few years since age 21. But that was not a joke. I said the jokes, opening jokes are over. It's been a few years. So I learned, you know, so I, just, I took God seriously on a few things. Some things I didn't want to agree with. But I went with it anyway. And I found that the Bible can be super trusted. I, I, I read the Bible, it's not like reading any other books. And I've read books, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, comic books. <laughs> and I know those, any of those things might have some truth in it, but I've found that the Bible is so steady. There's a reason why it's remained constant for thousands of years. You can trust the Bible. There's a lot of reasons for it. But so then if we value the Bible, we want those precepts and principles God wants us to know contained in the Bible to be a final authority on everything we do. In other words, if some preacher says this, but the Bible, it doesn't seem to match what the Bible says, that's a bad sign. That means you need to be careful. Maybe you want to question that person and say, 
If you can, I mean, if you care about them, you're going to want to know. Say, eh, I, you said this in church. Maybe I misunderstood you. But, I mean, this is what I read in the Bible. Maybe you could help me with this because I don't think, I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying is right. You may find out that there's something new you need to learn. You may find out that he has something new to learn. God expects us to love one another. We'll get to that shortly. But it's, if we're going to care about each other, it means we have to move forward and actually tell each other when, we, when we're, we think something's not quite right and go to someone with some humility and love. Humility and love. I'm not too good at humility. I'm not too good at love. I've worked on it for years. Guys may be better, but I wasn't very good. When I was 22 years old, I was good looking <laughs> and very smart. But I had a lot to learn about humility and love. And humility means not putting other people before yourself and also ad admitting that you don't know everything. When I was 22, I knew everything. It was great. <laughs> I was super smart and I knew everything. I had it down, baby. <laughs> Tell you what. But I learned humility. Either learn it the easy way or you'll learn it the hard way. If God loves you, he'll kick you around and say, yeah, you think you're that smart, huh? Well, you need to learn a few things. And so sometimes that has to happen to you. But if you learn it the easy way, we're learning about uh, Solomon and how he learned humility in our uh, study on Solomon. We just finished it, but we're also doing the book of Proverbs. So we're studying the wisdom books that, that he contributed to. And he talks about, you need to be humble. Why? Because otherwise you'll be an arrogant bastard. <laughs> you don't want to be that. People call you names. How does it end? We need both personal and in church life to use the Bible as our final authority. Everything we do in life. Not rely on other people, but rely on the scriptures and turn back to them again when we need answers. I, I, I just want to I want to just assure you that you need to fall into that. Actually take God seriously. Trust him. See what happens. What's the worst that can happen? Trust him and tell him you're doing it. He knows you are, but tell him, I'm trusting you, God. I read this thing in the Bible and I believe it's true and I'm praying about it because I think it might be the fact. I think this might be fact. Isn't that what happens when we come to God through Jesus? Do you know what I'm talking about? Hands. A few hands. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I see that calloused hand. Next. Sean works with his hands, so they get calloused. If you shake hands with them, you'll find out. <laughs> we value the eternal souls of all people. Wow. We want everyone to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, we better. We can have impersonal relationships with Jesus. How many have ever done that before, had an impersonal? Really? Just me? Oh, I had a very formal relationship with Jesus at one time. It was very formal. I would, I would have to knock on his door. I would, I would make an appointment to see him. Sometimes I wouldn't see him for a long time. That's an impersonal relationship. Whereas if I'm, if now I text him regularly. <laughs> Not literally. A personal relationship is somebody you spend a lot of time with. A personal relationship is someone who, who means a lot to you. When someone says something bad about him, you get bothered. I hear people say bad things about Jesus. I go, you don't know Jesus, do you? And I, well, you, that's, that's the end. The beginning is I get a little flushed. But if I learn to control my anger and not let my anger control me, then I do better. God has taught me that too. But the whole idea is you have to value the eternal souls of all people. My mother once told me something. She said, she talks about the eternal soul. She cared about the eternal soul of unborn children. And the first time I ever heard her say that, and I'm happy to see it written here, it impacted me because it made me think of people differently. I couldn't have been more than like eight or nine years old. What about his eternal soul? What about it? made me think about other people as having value that I can't possibly pay for. Yeah. 
I can't possibly match the value of another person. As one face differs from another, so does one soul from another. And so there are differences, but there are acute similarities. Do you want everyone to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you think about your friends? Think about your family members. Call them to mind now. You know people, friends and family members, they don't know Jesus. They don't know God. Recall them now to your mind. Pray for them now. Ask the Lord, please, reveal yourself to my friend. Reveal yourself to my family member. And help me be an instrument of your peace and truth. Yeah. Can you say that with me? Yeah. Pray that. Reveal yourself to my family member. Reveal yourself to my friend. Remind him that you love him. Help me to be an instrument of your peace. That's good. We might pray and stuff. That's crazy. Next one. Yeah, next one, please. Yes. We value genuine love and compassion. Ever have ingenuine love and compassion? I have. It's a substitute. It's like that cheap breakfast cereal. It's not the name brand you wanted. It's the, the off brand that your mother bought. <laughs> this isn't Cheerios. Oh, you'll love it. I don't. Because it's not genuine. <laughs> so why? Why do we value genuine love? Because we seek to express this love in a tangible ways. That means you can actually feel it. Something that's tangible, you can feel. You can feel it in your heart. You can feel it in your hand when you shake hands with someone that you just met or you know. What tangible ways? Physical, emotional, spiritual needs of those we interact with in church and in the world. This is really well written. How do we express genuine love physically? A hug? I didn't think about that. <laughs> I like hugs. Sometimes someone just needs help. Sometimes people, someone just needs something. Sometimes someone needs them to open the door because they're carrying a bunch of stuff. That's direct help. Then there's emotional help. We divide it up into three pieces. Physical, emotional, and spiritual. Fulfill someone's tangible emotional need. I maybe when I read this, you know, yesterday I thought about it. What is a tangible emotional need? What's a tangible way to meet someone's emotional? I mean, you know, physical I get, emotional, tangible, physical. Could be the hug that actually vends both. It's physical contact, but it's also an emotional help. You listen to somebody. Good. Keep listening. What is it? You pray for someone, but you let them know you're praying for them. See, that, that meets their emotional need. If you're praying for someone they don't know it, that might not meet their emotional need. But gosh, you feel a little more confident when someone's praying for you? A little bit more? I feel more confident because someone prayed for me this morning. All right? How else do we... Do we Tangible way to fulfill someone's emotional need. Kind words. Say again, Heather. Kind words. I'm sorry, Sarah with an H. <laughs> kind words. Kind Some, words. Like say, saying something encouraging to somebody or just saying, you know, that's a great looking haircut. <laughs> showing up. Showing up. They say showing up is 80% of success. Just show up. Be there. Showing up. Yeah, that, that reminds me. Someone shows up. <laughs> I won't tell any more stories. Going to spiritual needs. How do we, when tangible ways, do we fulfill a spiritual need? I think by sharing scripture, and Sister Donna shares scripture and prayer on our church app frequently. I appreciate that when she does. It's super duper. Others just um, take time to help out in ways that they know someone needs some spiritual encouragement because we're filled with we're in a world filled with sin, awful people, 
Sometimes we're the awful person and we need to correct ourselves, fix our lives. Sometimes we just need someone to lift us up because we're just so discouraged. And maybe we've experienced some awful tragedy. Maybe you have. Maybe you've experienced an awful tragedy recently and it's hurt you. But understand that there are people that need you and it's okay to need others too because then you find out that there's a spiritual component to your life that needs nurturing. Next one, please. Ah, we value, ho value holy living. Don't get nervous. Each one of us knows we're not holy, holy. Only the Lord is holy, holy, holy. But then he says things like, I am holy. You must be holy like me. So in kind to God's holiness, we need to be reaching for holiness. <coughs> what does holiness mean? It means that we take God seriously, we take ourselves seriously, we realize that we don't own ourselves. I don't own me. I gave myself to God. I said, God, you want me, don't you? He said, yes. I actually want you. I, don't be I didn't believe that at first. Uh, that's getting a little heavy, and I don't want to shake some people out of the room. But that's the truth. God wants you. He made you to be a wonderful person, and you still have that potential. And you're, you're, you're partway there, never perfect. I read something wonderful this year. It said, and this is actually a quote from a number of different saints who had read this and said this sentence aloud, a number of famous, you know, Christian writers, and they said, we all follow God imperfectly. No one follows God perfectly. That's what that means, right? Yeah. No one follows God perfectly. So in one respect, you can say, oh, good, because I know I'm not perfect. And in another respect, you sort of say, yeah, but I got room for improvement, and so I'm going to stretch it. So don't feel bad that you're not perfect, but achieve holiness. And this is called sanctification as we get better and better. We have to reform our lives. And sometimes you go through multiple reforms, well, not sometimes, everybody goes through multiple reforms in their life. Right, Sharon? Sharon knows a lot about this. She's very smart. We are called to be, conduct our lives as ambassadors of Jesus and to be transformed into his image. Now, this doesn't mean you get a special parking spot. It means that you must take seriously who you are. Because if you call yourself Christian, everyone's going to look at you and say, well, how Christian are you? So, we've got to be pretty good. <laughs> you've got to live up to that standard a little bit. And that's good. You want to be a decent human being, don't you? Yes. Don't you? Okay. This, coupled with love and grace, should draw others to Jesus. Because then you'll be genuine instead of phony. Mm -hmm. You'll be the good breakfast cereal. Because they will see a genuine difference in, your, in our hearts and lives. Okay, next slide, please. We value the church family. God designed the church to be a body that functions together as a whole, not simply individual parts existing separately. We seek to make the church family a priority in our lives so as we benefit the entire body. Did you know that because you're here, it means God has something for you here? Church is kind of a magical place in a way. I know when I go to church, when I go anywhere, when I go to church, it means God has something for me to do there. And maybe it's just shaking hands with someone I never met before. Maybe it's just listening carefully to something I hadn't heard before. Or maybe it's just reminding someone that God loves them. Maybe some little purpose. God's going to use you, and you may never know how you benefit that other person or how you might be benefited yourself, but it's going to be something good. And isn't it better to work together and to be together to encourage each other and challenge each other? And sometimes it's like, it's like the man who comes and he says, I need charity, and we have a benevolence fund, and we reach out and we give charity. Who benefits? Both. Both. 
The receiver of the charity gets something because they need help. The giver of charity learns to be generous and loving, right? You learn to be more like God, who sends the rain on the, on the guilty and the innocent alike, and who loves to give. If you feel like you're lacking today, remember, God loves to give and wants to give you something, something that, not a cheap imitation of something you want, but the best kind of thing, whatever that might be. Am I right? It's the truth. So then you say, okay, God, I'm ready to believe that. What, what happens next? And, and he'll lead you. Yeah, you take the next step. We, the, this is, I'm speaking broadly. You can mean, mean different things, right? Okay, next one. Do we have one more? That's the last one. Okay, good, because I'm out of time. Because <laughs> we have communion coming up. And so uh, we must prepare ourselves for that. So if you guys are ready, we'll go do that next.